This is The Future Of, where experts share their vision of the future and how their work is helping shape it for the better. I'm David Carsten. In a few months' time, Australia will vote in a referendum to recognise the First Nations people of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice in our constitution. The opportunity to change the constitution and recognise a First Nations voice has been described as Australia's moment. To explore this topic, I was joined by Professor Cheryl Kickett-Tucker. Cheryl is a Wajak Noongar woman from Western Australia. She is a research fellow at Curtin University and member of the National Co-Design Group, which was tasked with developing models for an Indigenous voice to Parliament. She is also the director of Koya Aboriginal Corporation, trading as the Quartermidge Institute in Midland, WA. Cheryl and I spoke about what the voice to Parliament is and how it came about, and what it could change for First Nations people and all Australians. If you'd like to find out more about this research, you can visit the links provided in the show notes. First of all, Professor, what what is the proposed voice to Parliament and and how did it come about? Well, let me think about that one. Um, I got a tap on the shoulder from Minister Ken White, who was the Federal uh, Minister for Indigenous Affairs for the Liberal Party. And he was pulling together people around the country uh, and setting up council committees to help, you know, research and build this voice, whatever it might be. So I was part of the um, the co-design committee. So there were people right across the country. Um, and our job was to uh, look at the remit of having a voice and what kind of structure and how should it operate. And, you know, like we already knew the why, but how should it run? Who should run it? How should we organise it across the country? You know, notwithstanding all the stuff that's done before, you know, there was... A lot of banter in the room, good banter, because you need people from all different opinions and experiences and abilities and all that sort of, and qualifications um, and connection to community. Um, so I think we did a pretty good job, you know, uh, putting that together. And we need it because people like me, despite being qualified, experienced and connected, we're still not heard. That's the thing. So I'm hoping, you know, that it will allow everybody to be heard. So is that what it is? That's what it is. A that, means of being heard. That's what it is. It's to, first of all, you. it's the referendum is about um, constitutional recognition of Aboriginal people. And the second part of that is, you know, having this voice to parliament. And, and I know the rhetoric has been around, oh, it's going to be a Canberra-based bunch of academics. Well, that's not true at all. That's not true at all. The way that we had designed it was that the all uh, people in the regions had a local voice and a regional voice, and then we had from that a national coalition um, at parliament to be able to say uh, to have uh, basically to have connection to the people who are writing policies and procedures because for the government because there's such a disconnection of what's happening on the ground. That's the biggest problem. There has to be communication, and there is none. <laughs> You know, we have to go through, we're an industry. The Aboriginal people in this country are an industry. You know, we employ people at local government, state government, federal government. You know, we want that to change. We want to, um, you know, lead our own lives, you know, have an economic base, you know, share in the wealth of this country without climbing through all the rhetoric of local, state and federal. Here we do it on our own terms and in our own, in our own places. Our government systems are very different. And so... You know, at the moment, the voice that we do have, you know, non-Aboriginal people like the ones that talk really loud and the ones that talk a lot and they go, that's the leader. We didn't appoint those people, the leaders. You did, not us. Do you know what I mean? Our leaders are quiet people who get on and work together, you know, for a, um, an outcome that's practical for their people on the community. But that connection, what's happening in community to the people that are in the power structures, it's, it's, it's not there. It's, you know... If we keep doing the same thing over and over again, the closing the gap and there's 17 socioeconomic indicators, we're all going to be going, they're, they're still going in the wrong direction or they're plateauing over the last five years. And the definition of crazy is keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. This is the difference. It has to be. Now, will it make the big difference? It's a start, you know? It, you know, being a human being, you either got to learn from mistakes 
and move on? Or do you, you know, stay in that status quo? Well, I refuse to stay in that status quo. That's why I'm voting yes. We have to try something. We have to try something, you know. And I know there's some rhetoric out there that people say, um, you know, what difference is this going to make? It's like the ATSIC days, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission and things like that. But we have to try something. Otherwise, what is the other alternative? Where is it? Who's got it? Well, if it's not working now. If it's not working now. We've got to do something. And I don't think it's going to fix everything, but can it elevate and, um, you know, turn up the volume on the families and communities who had never been heard? If that's what comes out of this, then I'm for it. Absolutely. You were the only WA woman appointed to this national co-design group. If it's relevant, can you can you share with us what it meant to be part of this group uh, as the only WA woman and 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 what that actually involved? I mean, you've gone into that or yeah. to some degree. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's it's a lot to hold on your shoulders, right? Um, and I, maybe the minister selected me because I do have very thick back. You know, um, maybe maybe that's the reason. But I think my connection in my community being grounded, you know, I might have all these qualifications, but I am me from Midland, you know, and I had that connection with my, and I love my people, you know. Um, one of the things I think he probably put me on it, and I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure this would be the case, is the connection I have with young people and children. And I've been working in with Aboriginal kids and young people forever, you know, um, outside of my university life. And I think maybe that was a reason, and I m made a highlight of that, that the young people's voice must shine, shine through this whole process. You cannot leave them out in any way or fashion. There has to be a mechanism for young people and youth and um, children to be able to have a say as well. Professor, in terms of informing ourselves, is the, the release of the essays um, via the Australian Electoral Commission ahead of the referendum, will it go some way to helping us become better informed about each side of the argument? I think all bits of information are important. Uh, I haven't read those essays per se, but I have just had a quick look at who wrote those essays and I would like to ask people to think about the lens on which people are giving that information back to you as a people, as a, you know, as a group and as a nation. Um, so I know the Yes campaign, uh, there's some fairly prominent people, Aboriginal people that are for that campaign and um, and for the no campaign, there are judges and legal eagles. And so you got to question, I guess, the um, the source of that information, where they're coming from, what is their lens, what is their life experiences and, you know, does that shape the message that's coming out and which one are you, you know, you're going to look at both and, you know, you're going to make your decision. But it's up to people where they really want to make an effort and find out about what this truly means for their country. What is the overall feeling amongst your community about this upcoming referendum? I agree with you. There's not enough information. There's a lot of misinformation and even our people are caught up in that at the moment. Yeah. I, you know, I reached out to a government department to get some resources to start building um, the knowledge base of our young people. And it's, it's, I'm still waiting. I'm, bit disappointed in that. Um, I, I, I don't think the message has been really clear for anybody. No matter what colour you are, what heritage, how old you are, what side of the politics, I don't think it's been clear enough. And um, that's a bit of a shame because um, we want to be proactive, you know. If people vote no, then they've got all the information they're supposed to have. But I don't think it's enough at the moment. You know, this, the, the message is, is being construed by media and... I'm concerned about that. Well, just on the no argument, um, some of the arguments around that campaign um, are that a voice won't deliver meaningful on the ground change for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and and that sovereignty, uh, that sovereignty and treaty should be prioritised over voice. Um, what are your thoughts on, on uh, that? I, I'm a pretty, you know simple person like you know, action right action for me is you've got to have the voice first you've got to have you've got to be in the team so the the rest of the players know what's going on and then you can build you know the treaty and you know the other pieces that come into you know the the voice afterwards but we need to get in the space first you can't just sit on the sidelines and say we want this this and this without having our people in that space in the first place you need the warriors on the inside as well as on the outside 
And I mean that in a good way, not not negative and de- destructive. You need, you know, really s- strong, proud people who know the meaning of community because that's what this is really all about, is about making sure that the community have a voice and that voice is enacted. Now, that's the piece you're asking me about. That's another piece of work I think that's going to happen. But for, for now, we need to get our community in that decision-making sort of space, you know, getting that voice so that decision-makers know what's really going on on the ground. Because they, they don't. They had no idea. You need to be in the tent to determine the shape of the tent. And so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, got to start somewhere. And I think, you know, you got to be pragmatic about it. We've got to get there first before we start doing step two and step three. You know, they are equally important, but you can't do everything when you're trying to mobilise a nation and a nation within a nation. You know, you've got to take a step at a time. Look, this is um, this is such a big question uh, because there are so many layers to it. But what would a yes vote actually mean for you, and and what do you hope it will actually change for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Well, I will take this point as an academic at a university, right? So the yes vote for me is I won't have to beg the governments to say that the research I'm doing is actually making a difference to the lives of Aboriginal kids in education. They will actually go, well, let, we've got the evidence and we are listening to the voice. So for me, I'm being um, honest about the research that I conduct and I'm hoping that I don't have to keep, keep continually have to prove the worth of the work that we're doing because that's what we're doing. We're constantly proving. And once we train one person up in government and they bugger off, the next person comes and we're going to do it over and over and over and over again and we get worn out, you know, because they're not doing their job and they're disconnected to community. And they're not listening. So having a voice and having the yes campaign and the referendum into this space, um, it, it means that they have to listen to us. You know, they've got to listen to what's going on in the community and the needs and the wants and the wishes and the challenges, but also celebrating all the good stuff. There's a lot of good stuff going on as well. We tend to have this deficit modelling, which we as a nation want to change. You know, um, I work with kids who come into my school programs um, and they're, they're pigeonholed so early in their age and they become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, you don't need to be that. You can be exactly what you're supposed to be, but you have to teach kids to unlearn and, and get rid of that deficit modelling. And what are your strengths? Well, look, it, it, it was something we were going to look into a little bit further down the chat, but it, it would be a perfect opportunity now just to perhaps expand a little bit on what your research area actually is, Professor. Okay, so I've done a quite a bit of work over the last couple of decades, but the one I'm in at the moment, it's an Australian Research Council grant. It was the first grant of its kind at this university. So it won the um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander um, Fellowship. It was called the Discovery Indigenous Award. And it was the largest amount the ARC in its history had awarded anybody. Um, so we've hit, a, we've hit two sort of targets. You know, they weren't our targets, but we've hit two targets. There you go. But what we're doing is we're looking at Noongar language and culture. We, we've So it's a five-year project and we're at the end of it. Over the, uh, the first couple of years, we went into community, ran a series of yarning circles with kids, schools, teachers, um, parents, elders, about what's lacking in the school environment in terms of Noongar culture and language. You know, the government have a mandate, cultural standards framework, it's not mandatory. Here's the problem. If my voice mattered, I would say, make it mandatory, you see. So in the case of the work that we're doing, the Mumbaki Cultural Learnings Program, it's um, it's a one shire council at the moment with primary schools and we've built a program of Noongar language and culture and we've got three interfaces. So you've got your traditional classroom sort of learning via PowerPoints and slides, and but we've built our own resources So and they're absolutely amazing. The second component is using, um, we've got a seven-week seven, seven week program um, and the second week of the program um, is a digital component. So it's using iPads and doing a, the Mumbaki Quest on an iPad based on the classroom activities from the week before. Then the third part of it is a digital 3D Mumbaki game quest that you learn about Noongar language and culture in a 3D environment. And the, cha- the what we're trying to do is is alter the kids' perceptions of schools by knowing that their language and culture is a priority in the school to hopefully impact their attendance, their retention in school, 
and their achievement in terms of um, you know wanting to do better. But really, to get that happening, we're building their identity, self-esteem, their pride, their coping strategies for any discrimination that might come their way. Um, and it's it's we're we're nearly at the end of it, and it's been an absolute amazing ride. We've the kids have helped build these digital games with the undergraduates at the lab of the design and built environment here, where in the School of Education come together. We've had pr- primarily non-Aboriginal undergraduates from lots of different countries work with Aboriginal kids for the first time in their lives, bring community together, and we've built this massive three D uh, game, which is getting a lot of airplay. Um, There's a lot of places that want it, but they can't have it because it's a research project. And um, all the resources that we've built, we've utilised photographs and videos from the kids over the years. So they're in the resourcing. We've done a rap song, the Mumbaki rap song. We've done a video to go with it. And we've got an on-country camp coming up um, at the end, uh, sorry, at the start of September to bring it all together. So you're saying you were a, a few months away from mm. completing this yeah. research project. So the, the data's coming together, and, and obviously, and what what what, is the re, what are the results revealing? Oh, um, so we're in the sort of um, pre-test, mid-test. So we've got a bit more data to collect. But kind of what I'm noticing, um, yeah, schools need a bit more help in regards to their cultural integrity, and and doing things. The you know having a wrap's one thing, but you actually got to there's a bit of work to do. You know, and you know, and their resource only to so far, and they need a few more staff to be, be able to work and make that happen. Um, so that's that's an issue for the education department that we need to work with to make that happen. Um, with the kids themselves, it's a mixed bag. Um, you know, and um, at the moment, the the attendance rates of most kids are okay, but I do know in this state that we've got the second worst Aboriginal attendance rate for kids, according to the close in the gap. So again, if an example of the voice is to listen to this research, the voices of the kids and the families and the teachers in the school, um, and some of them are Aboriginal, that if this is working, then they need it in their schools. I shouldn't have to go and promote it and prove it over and over again to a government department when the families have said, this is working, you know, or it might need to be altered a little bit or whatever it might be. So the difference for us as an ac- in academia is that, yes, you know, I believe that hopefully the doors are open and people will listen to the truth because it is the truth. Why would we not say the truth? It's research, it's evidence. They like that word. It's right there. You talk about um, not being heard in this, uh, in this context. Just on that, how do you think a no vote might impact more widely on how we see ourselves and how the world sees Australia? <laughs> well, I think the world will be looking, well, they're looking at us now, aren't they? You know, and it's going to be an absolute shame, to be honest. Um, it's our chance. It, you know, it's a moment in history as well. I take it back to the, um, the you know, the when, when Aboriginal people were included on the census. I think it was back 67, 1967, right? So that meant my husband was born either as flora and fauna, right? A year later, I was born. So I luckily made it on the census as, as, as a human being. Tick, tick. So for me, the yes and the no vote, and for I know the community that I come from, this is a moment in history. You either get on that on that wagon and go towards the future of humanity, or you stay behind and be judged by the rest of the world. We don't have a great track record, you know, particularly in human rights across this nation, and in terms of sort of third world sort of conditions for some of the people in the regions. Uh, this will just be another a cross, a, a horrible cross on our record for humanity, no matter where you come from. People are people and we must treat them as such, you know, and this is a chance for people to stand up and go, I'm part of the human race and these are Aboriginal people. These are the first nations of this country. And yes, I'm going to vote yes. And just on that, on the vote, how can Australians ensure that they're actually properly informed? We, we touched on this at the very beginning, yeah, the the resources to actually inform ourselves. Where are they? Well, yeah, they're far and few between, but I know there's a bit of uh, social media and they're hitting that quite a lot. But if you don't have social media, you're in trouble, aren't you? So, you know, in research, we use, you know, like a triple threat effect, like in basketball, right? This is what we do. We talk, you know, face to face. We um, text 
and we email, right? So we, we hit three sort of areas like of communication channels. And I know there's social media and I know there's, you know, there's mainstream media. So there's five that they can tackle if they so wish to. I know there was a yes campaign um, a community get together. I think it was last Sunday. Uh, the yes one two three. That's a website people can go to. Uh, yes one two three dot com. That you can go to um, to have a look at. Um, but that's all I know. I'm sorry. That's all I know for now. Some people call you professor. Mm -hmm. Others call you coach. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that other hat you wear. Oh, I love that other hat. That's where the heart work, the court, which is Noongar word for heart, comes into it because. Um, that's for me personally, as an academic working in an institution, um, that's the medicine that puts the rights in the wrongs, that puts the feel, the heartbeat in the heart, you know, and you get to see change automatically in young people, you know, and, uh, families and kids, and you get to hear what's truly going on in the ground. You, I'm not, not far from it. So you can get caught up in institutions and stay in the books and research and, and stay in that space. And, but it is limiting. You know, you have to, if you truly want to make a difference, and if the research you're supposed to, you're supposed to make a difference to the, you know, to people, to environment or whatever it might be. And in my case, I work with young Aboriginal people and also other vulnerable groups of kids as well. And so I can actually see a difference or they can tell me how things are really going. So I don't lose sense of that and I stay in touch and I stay humble. You gotta stay humble. Cheryl, it is in a very specific context. Uh, it's it's through an interest that has been with you for your entire life. Tell us about your involvement with basketball. Oh, I love basketball. It's a great sport. Absolutely great sport. It's team sports like basketball. You don't, you know, when you come from a poor family and I did, you don't need much. You don't even a pair of boots. You know, you don't even need a bucket. You just need a ball and you can just, you know, play. And you can play with one person on against a wall, you know, practice your shooting, dribbling, passing on the wall. And then you can play with two people, three It doesn't matter. You can, you know, you can even play in high heels if you want. I've had a kid do that once. And, um, yeah, just for fun, you know. Um, but I've played ever since I was 10 years of age and went through the ranks, of course. Um, would have liked to have done a lot more as a player. Um, but my mum said this words, these words, and this was at the age of 14, because I used to play for the Swan City Master, or Swan Districts in those days as a junior, and I was in this SBL team when I was, um, four, I think it was 14. I was sitting on the bench at 14. Uh, SBL being State State Basketball, Basketball League, yeah. And um, I used to umpire to pay for my fees and my uniform and stuff. That was the only way I could do it. Um, and I, you know, I just volunteered anywhere I could go. I just loved the sport so much because it brought a family um, to me and I become part of another larger family and being an Aboriginal person, that sort of kinship kind of connections is really important and I love it. You know, it, you know, it, you don't need to be the best player in the court, you, you, you know, two legs and a heartbeat, you're a part of the team, you know, and that's what I love about it, you know. Well, you are underplaying it a bit. You did say you would have liked to have taken it further, and you really had the ability to do so. Yeah. Can you tell us how far you got? Well, I ended up playing in the WNBL with the Perth Rockets, which was the 1987. We had went on this huge trip on the east coast of Australia, and two weeks did our whole season in the Conference League to be able to uh, – we won that, and that gave us eligibility to WNBL, which where the breakers were then formed after that. So that's Perth's representative team in the national competition. That's right. Yeah, like Perth Wildcats, I guess. Um, but I'll just take a step back. But when I was 14, my mum said this. You cannot eat a basketball because that's what I was doing, basically, all day, all night, weekends, which I'm still doing that now. Um, so I had to, you know, do something with my life. And I said to my mum, I'm going to go to America and play basketball. And it wasn't until seven years later um, that I managed to go to the US on an academic scholarship. Unfortunately, I was a postgraduate student, so I wasn't allowed to play in the college system. Age 16, I was given a uh, invite to try out for the Raging Cajuns at Louisiana State University. But at 16, I was too scared to go, <laughs> you know, and I was really firmly cemented here in Perth and 
um, yeah, it wasn't my journey. Like I look back now and it wasn't my journey. The journey I was on was my journey. And, and anyway, I ended up going to the University of Oregon. I did a Master of, uh, Master of Science in Sports Psychology and Motor Control Development and Learning um, on a year scholarship. I did a Master's in one year. And played a bit of ball over there, made a lot of friends, um, and uh, came home and did a PhD in education. But I still, you know, dabbled in the basketball and built a community program, which is still running today. What sort of impact does that program have? Tell, tell us a little bit more about that. What's the full name and, and how is it really making a difference? It started off as Cart Court and Hoops, which is Head, Heart and Hoops, right? But it's now called the Kudamich Institute Grassroots Basketball Program. Kudamich means your essence of soul. Um, it, it's run through an ACO, and an ACO is an Aboriginal community controlled organisation that my father, who's a stolen generation survivor, had started two decades ago. Two decades ago. Oh, that, that's, that must be an incredible legacy for you to carry on. It is. So when Dad, yeah, when Dad, um, his name is Alan Kickett, when he needed help keeping it running, um, I was, um, I was, I was still working at, in, in academia, but I had a bit of time, you know, and I, got doing, I was doing a bit of part-time work. And so I said to my father, oh, you know, I'll come in and I'll, you know, as a volunteer, get it all off the ground and keep it running, right? But build on the legacy you put forward for the demand and the changes and the need for the community at this point in time. Um, so, and that's what we did. So we have, I think, 25 staff across two sites. Yeah. And um, Midland is where we hail from. And we've got a site in um, um, Quinana. And, but those programs, some of those programs are under threat, Here's a, you know, like, because they've been running for so long in the government, because it, they're doing so well, the government will pull the funding from it. So people like me, as a direct, I'm a director there, I have to go and continually argue with the government to listen to my voice, to say, the evidence is there, it's been operating so well, continue to please fund this program because Aboriginal people's lives are in your hands. So for me, again, the voice, the vote of yes is very important to keep an ACCO, an Aboriginal community controlled organisation for the past two decades operating and hitting the kind of targets, um, you know, keeping kids alive, keeping them safe, keeping them, um, you know, mixing with each other. Because at the moment we've got, there's a 60-40 split uh, for Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal kids and they hail from 30 plus different nationalities. So it's the own mini United Nations all together mm. on a Saturday at basketball or whatever it might be, you know. Um, and um, it's it's hitting hitting a lot of wins. Um, we're quiet achievers. We don't promote it because that's our way. That's our way of doing business, you know. Yeah. Wow. But the community, no. The most important people are the community, hence why the voice is important. So those community can, can say what they need to say about what we do and what other groups like us do in the area. Um, you know, to make sure that the policy makers are listening and keep programs going. And they're not cut them because they're successful. Well, that's the odd thing, isn't it? Oh, the, you're, okay. you're meeting those those uh, nebulous sort of um, <laughs> concepts that we like to call KPIs. KPIs. You know, uh, yeah. uh, you're meeting them, exceeding them, uh, and yet you're finding yourself in a position where you have to keep on arguing, arguing. for your, your always, liability. Always arguing, always arguing about where the need is. It's happening now in state government with particular departments who tell us you cannot do this and you cannot do that. I mean, how would you know? You don't work in the community, you don't know. You're following a bunch of gu guidelines that you've set from a lens that's not our lens, not our lived experience, and hence, again, why the vote is important, you know. Um, I often say to people, I have a few letters after my name, I always say, now, how many more after my name do you need until you'll start listening to me? It's really difficult. It is really, really being a female qualified Aboriginal and I know what I know and I'm I love my people I'm really connected with the passion that I have um people f fear that the government fear that you know when really they should be embracing what you bring it's to... been really hard to be honest the, the the um the community stuff has been it's always an argument it's always a fight it's always proving 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 like I, I've reached out to people very profile people and go how do we do it what is the key? How, how do you do it? Because we can't work it out. So if anybody out there in TV world or radio world know, please let me know because it's really difficult. Difficult to... Well, be heard. To be heard. Just to, well, the voice, right? Yeah, there you go. 
you have a lot of work ahead of you. <laughs> it just it just seems to never end. But the voice it does, it does, does, does represent a, a possible way of adding some edges to that square, like you say. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I would say, you know, when you're driving a car and you're going, you're on a journey, you can get to either a T intersection or a roundabout. I see this as a roundabout. Because T intersection, you only got one way or the other way. Or, or if you go ahead, you get into a dead end, right? But a roundabout, there's motion and you can go around and around until you get it right, until you get off on the, on the exit that you're supposed to. So for me, the, the, the Yes campaign is kind of that. If you think of it as a journey, it's not the be all and end all. It's not going to solve everything, but it's a journey in a direction. And it's okay if we go around in circles a little bit, but not, hopefully not for too long. Eventually we'll get off on the right exit. And that's how I see it. There is always in your world, it seems for, for, for those of us listening, something to do, a fight that needs to be fought, uh, an argument that needs to be argued. You, you're a researcher, a director, a board member, mm -hmm. a community leader. You're a, a, a member of the Order of Australia. You're an author. Mm -hmm. You're a mum of mm -hmm. three kids. Mm -hmm. what, what pushes you to, to be involved in so many different areas? Uh, well, I like the spice of life. I colour outside the square. I don't colour inside it. I break a few rules and I, sh you know, hopefully teach kids you don't have to be what society expects you to be. You can have, you can do what you want, when you want, whenever you want. You, that's what life's about, having a crack at everything. I like the variety in life. I like the spontaneity. And um, I have a, I have a, it, for me, it's like living and breathing. You've got to do a little bit of everything. Otherwise, you're not alive. That, that's just me personally. Um, for, I guess, the kids in the community, um, you know, one of the, the, one of the reasons I named the basketball program Carp Court and Hoops was to build kids so that they could see their own light, be their own beacon and light their own pathway to, a, to an horizon that they can see. It's their horizon. It's their reality. The yes vote for me enables that, enables us as a nation to be lit up. We're our own beacon and we're all going in the same direction. Um, you know, the same pathway and, and to an horizon that's better for everybody. And that's how I see the yes vote. You know, um, not everyone's going to agree with it and that's fine. Hopefully over time they're on that roundabout with us, going around in circles a few, and then eventually we'll come off on an exit, but then come back and then get off on another exit. Because life is like that. You've got to taste and touch and feel and be and exist, you know, but you, you're you can't exist for too long because that means you're not living, you know. So I think for me, doing a little bit of everything, that's the living part. You can breathe while you're living. When you're existing, you're confined. I don't want people to be confined. Families and kids I work with, I, I don't want to be the person that talks. I want the action. It has to match. So what happens with our community is they watch our action and our body language and they measure the authenticity and integrity. Now, if we don't have that, I could talk all day and no one will listen to me. But if I match it with action and meaningful action and also show my empathy and compassion, because I'm just like those kids, I'm no different. Um, and hopefully that will inspire people to vote yes, to listen to people like myself, you know, to get, take away all the professor titles. At the end of the day, I'm a girl from Midland, love my people, love my community, and the communities, everybody in that community. And I work with all a lot of those families from all different nationalities because we're all part of, you know, the world of being a human being, you know, at the end of the day. We all have to get on with each other. And um, I have a lot of people do ask me, you know, questions about Aboriginal people, and I'm happy to talk to them about that stuff because a lot of people are too frightened to ask the question or they don't know what to say, they don't know where to get the information from. But so if I'm having a coffee somewhere and someone might ask me, I'll talk to them. I have that friendly nature, you know, and a lot of people are like that. Is that the key ahead of um, the referendum, just to talk a bit more? I think so. And even ask the questions like, you know, get on the radio shows, get on the media, and but be very careful about who's responding. Like just check in the kind of sort of, the lens and the lived experience and, you know, and the connection that those people who are giving you information, are they legit in your eyes? You know, only you know. No one can tell you your own truth. You've got to go find it and you've got to seek it out yourself. 
So talking is one part of the equation. The other, the other part is actually thinking it through. Yeah, and uh, can we please not be lazy Australians? Can we please be Australians who think for ourselves and not be force-fed on what's been shown in mainstream media, social media? I mean, you can. There's no filters. People can say whatever they want on social media, it, but it's their reality, right? Whether it's right or wrong, that's up to them. But you, as a person, surely you know you've got to question what you're seeing and. And how does it make you feel? And, and truly in your heart, is it the right thing to do? And it is. The world is watching us. Your family, your children, your grandchildren are going to be judging you in future years to come. Because eventually it'll get, this will get done. It will get done. It will get done. Cheryl, it's such a critical juncture in history. Um, ahead of this referendum, it's been an absolute pleasure to listen to you. And um, thank you very much for talking to us today. Thank you for having me on the um, on the show. You've been listening to The Future Of, a podcast powered by Curtin University. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it. And if you want to hear more from experts, stay up to date by subscribing to us on your favourite podcast app. Bye for now.